on the iPad. So, um, so here's what I'm here to talk about today. Does anybody here have a dog who, well, let's face it, they cry, they house soil, they're destructive when they're left home alone, and they make everybody miserable. Yeah, anybody know a, a dog like that? Tony T, you can come on up here, little guy. That a boy. Well, um, I'll tell you something. These pets do much better with canine-specific leadership, and it looks different than what we do in our homes with our families. Um, you know, we love them like they were little people in furry suits, and that's a very good thing, because I'm like that. But the real difference is that if we don't recognize the important differences, the species differences, and treat them accordingly, we don't get very good results. And I'm going to be real specific and cite a little bit of recent research on this. So OJ is here. Wonderful. Thank you, OJ, for coming. And Wanda from Las Cruces, Cindy and Martha, thank you very much. And Misty, I'm delighted that you're here. Thank you for coming. I hope everybody can hear me. If you can hear me loud and clear, send some hearts up if you don't mind, just so that I know that this microphone is working because, you know, again, we tried something new this time. So um, anybody here have a dog who tosses the house when they're gone? Well, put it in the comment line. Thank you. Okay, I know you can hear me now. Put it in the comment line and let me know what's going on at your place. If you have dogs who, you know, cause you to be a little bit concerned about, what's their state of mind when they're home alone? And by the way, in case we haven't met, I'm veterinarian Dr. Jeff Nickel, along with Tony and uh, Gaston, the little fuzzy white guy. He's here someplace. Oh, he's behind me. Okay. Anyway, he'll show up. And um, <laughs> so... Um, and we are dogless now. I know everybody here who's watching right now knows that. Um, we've been thinking about getting another puppy, but it's going to be a little while. It just takes a long time to get our hearts ready for that. So, but it'll happen. And that little rascal will play a part in these things at that point. So I won't make it a surprise. I'll make sure everybody knows it's coming. So anyway, um, tell me where you're from. I already know a bunch of folks, but um, let me start with a story. This is a little Bichon Frise, little fuzzy white guy. It's a dog owned by or parented by John and Heidi. The little guy's name is Volta, a really sweet dog every time I've met him in the exam room. But they brought him to me because he'd been urine soiling and they could not get that under control. They had dog trainers trying to help them. They'd use good methods. Why hadn't this worked? Well, they needed some help dog also had some fear problems and aggression. They had three other dogs in the house. One's this enormous Great Dane, real laid back dog. Um, another was a Golden Retriever and another one's kind of a medium sized mixed bred guy. And the other dogs were pretty good. Volta was the problem. Well, so, you know, and he was clingy. He was all the time glomming onto them. And they, and they noticed that without me having to say anything to them, not to ask. Of course, we take an exhaustive history. So I went through all the details with these folks, and I said, you know, there are a couple of possibilities. Number one, we may still have a dog who's not well house trained. We know from research, statistically, that small breed dogs, some of them, you never can get them fully house trained. They just aren't going to do it. So what we do is try to make sure that we've done everything properly that way and that we've controlled all the other inappropriate or unhealthy behaviors that these guys have. So what are we going to do with, with Volta? Well, make sure that he had no physical problems, check the urinalysis, make sure there was no infection, no bladder stone, uh, kidneys were good, all the internal organs looked fine on the lab profile and on physical exam. So we pretty much ruled out other physical problems. You know, the rest of it was in this organ up here. So we uh, also considered, what about a separation anxiety problem? Because so many dogs with that disorder or house oilers. So um, I said, I want you to get a video and send it to me. These folks didn't live right around the corner. They live in Las Cruces. And if you're familiar with New Mexico, you know that Albuquerque and Las Cruces, it's about a five hour drive. So they sent me a video. Now I'd love to be able to show that to you on a Facebook Live, but you know, I don't know how to do that. So here's what this thing looked like. They had this surveillance camera, just a home surveillance system up in the corner of the, of the wall. And they had, um, where the heck is Gaston? Oh, he's back there. Gaston, he's not participating. Tony's being kind of fussy every time I put him in my lap. Must be, 
yeah, sure. Uh, he must be camera shy. Um, there, <laughs> Tony, here, look, there's some food for you, son. Look. Do you want some cat, some cat food? Well, that's a good boy. We call it cat food because he would eat dog food every chance he got. So, okay, so we looked at this video. Well, so Great Dane is pooped out on the couch, completely relaxed. The uh, Golden Retriever's on the floor. He's taking a snooze. It's the middle of the afternoon. John and Heidi are both at work. So, what the heck is Volta doing? Well, he's walking around on the floor, pacing. Not quickly. Typical dog with separation anxiety is a slow pacer, although some of them run frantically. Some of them hang out at the exit door. Some of them, of course, scratch the door, try to tear off the doorknob, rip through, literally, the sheetrock next to the door, tear off the door frame, or they run to the window and rip off the, the uh, window blinds. I mean, all of those things have been known to happen, but this particular dog, and they're all different, was a pacer, a slow pacer. And he would walk past the other dogs, past the couch. They paid no attention to him because they were used to his behavior. They lived with him every day, right? So also in the frame, it was a really well, uh, a well framed video. You know, it had, it had everything we needed. Off in the corner, I could see the sliding glass door. And they had a, those vertical blinds there. Well, and occasionally, Volta would slow pace over towards the sliding glass door. And with his face, he would push away the vertical blinds. And he would look out there, and then he would come back. And at one point, of course, he walked past the corner of the wall and hiked his leg and urinated a pretty generous amount. House training? Well, the question was, did he ever do this when they were home? And the answer was, no, he only did it when they were gone. Well, that and what I saw in that video made it pretty clear that we really didn't have a house training problem. The dog understood the rules, but he was breaking those house training rules when he was home alone because he was freaked out. He was just one scared little puppy, anxious, upset, worried, couldn't hold still. And we saw indicators of his anxiety when he was home with his people because he was clingy. And he would go after the other dogs when they came near him. So that's a problem. Does anybody have a dog like that? Let me see if there are any comments. Um, well, so, oh, there we go. Yes, you're coming in loud and clear. Thank you, OJ. Uh, from what I'm hearing, this is a much needed topic right now. Well, actually it is, Martha, and I'll tell you why. Is, um, and Misty from Albany. I'm, I'm just delighted that you tune in from there. Um, it is, and I'll tell you why, is because, you know, people had dogs who were marginally anxious when they had become accustomed to their people being away at work every day, but they were coping. They were still nervous. And they might have been doing just what Volta was doing, except maybe not the house soiling part. People don't necessarily know their dogs have separation anxiety. They don't all bark continually, some do. They don't all damage stuff, many do. Um, so people sometimes don't know. Well, then of course people had to work from home, many people, during the pandemic. And now people are sort of going back to work, some of them full time, some of them in this hybrid thing. And then, you know, with the Delta variant coming along, some of us might start be working from home again and doing Zoom meetings. I mean, who the heck knows? And this inconsistency is a problem. Dogs, by their nature, love predictability. If one event predicts the next event, then they understand what's going to happen. And a canine leader of a free-living social group of dogs in the wild, they have a routine. And so dogs, whether they have an anxiety disorder or not, really love a routine. So, our cats do too. but. You know, they're just, they're bonded to us differently. As you can see, Tony T, he's up here, but he probably won't stay. Or he might. When I'm at my computer, he sometimes he just sits in my lap for hours. And other times he's like, I, I'm not sure I want to be here right now. <laughs> so here's what we do with dogs who have a separation problem, is that we make sure that it's a structure that is predictable. Now, that's only one part of the whole management change that we need to put in place for these dogs to be set up to succeed. So we did that stuff with Volta. And we put him on a medication because he had these other anxiety-related behaviors that included aggression toward the other dogs. And of course, you know, he could intimidate that big Great Dane, you know, and that Great Dane could get defensive aggressive. And then we've got a very big problem with a Bichon Frise and a Great Dane. So we take that kind of stuff pretty seriously. 
So those problems improved. And the, surf, the, the house soiling improved somewhat as well. Um, but I had them do follow-up videos, and he was still doing this slow pacing that included going back to that sliding door, sticking his face out there, and then coming back again. And then occasionally he would still urine soil in the house. So I said, there's something going on outside. This dog, we've documented that he has separation anxiety, and we've documented that he has other kinds of anxiety disorders too. What's going on outside? Do you folks have uh, wild creatures? No, we don't have like coyotes in our neighborhood, and we don't have deer, and we don't have bobcats, you know, wild animals that could intimidate an indoor pet. I said, how about stray cats? Oh my goodness, we have dozens of those in our neighborhood. One of our neighbors feeds these stray cats, and they show up all the time. What do you think? Would a 15 or maybe a 20 pound dog be afraid of a bunch of outdoor cats? It's not so much fear. You know, when we have our dogs and our cats living inside our houses with us, we love that, don't we? I mean, they're, they're our house pets and they belong with us. They're domesticated creatures and they are our best friends. But they're really not genetically programmed to live in a structure with walls and windows fences, even leashes, they don't intrinsically understand that stuff. So if you have a dog who is well-adjusted and adaptable, they still don't understand all those artificial barriers that we call them, but they adapt, they go along. But if you have a dog who has an anxiety disorder, they go to that window often and they see those cats out there who they, that dog Volta may have felt that, I need to chase those guys out of here, they don't belong here. Or maybe I'm kind of nervous about this and I keep checking and he's an anxious dog anyway, boy, that just added to the problem. So I had John and Heidi invest in a couple of outdoor booby traps. And one of the best that I like is called the Scarecrow. It mounts to a fence. I wish I had one to show you right now. You mount it on a fence and you hook up a garden hose to it. Works at all times of the year except the uh, winter time. But it has an infrared beam and when some creature breaks that beam, it gets hosed. So they put a few of these along the fence and they, you know, discourage these cats. I also asked them, you know, the best thing, if you could talk to your neighbor about not um, feeding cats, boys, Gaston, come here, baby. Gaston, here, do you want the biscuit? There you go, that's a good boy. I would love to have Gaston in my lap because, here, son, do you want another biscuit? Oh, he says, okay, we'll work for food. Oops. Here, Gaston. You know, dogs are more cooperative for these things than cats. Oh, look, Tony T. Oh, look, he says, I'll take that cat food. There you go. Anyway, so um, when we were successful at really diminishing the stray cat population in that neighborhood, um, things got a lot better. So, anybody have a dog who house soils? Let me see if there's, there's a question here. Uh, our dog, Dakota, I've heard about Dakota before, chews on her legs when only when we are gone and she's alone and um, uh, without us. Um, and do you know uh, Christy? Oh, Christy, <laughs> I know you. <laughs> you haven't tuned in in a while. Um, Christy, it's great to hear from you. Yeah, and that's why the name Dakota stuck in my mind. Um, I'll tell you, you know, that could be what we call a displacement behavior. In other words, it's something that a creature does, including humans do this, like nail biting or, you know, other nervous habits, biting nails, that kind of stuff that people do when they're anxious um, and they can't get out of the situation that they're in. And if possible, they would love to just take off and run to the next county, but they can't. So you do something that you can do, such as a displacement behavior. So Dakota could be licking himself because he's anxious when you're gone and can't get the heck out of the house. One of the things I like to recommend for pets with separation behaviors is a dog door. And if your dog can go inside and outside and have a change of venue, then they can get comfortable. And if you have a digging box outside your house built into the north side of your house where the sun doesn't shine as much, ouch, Tony T, and you, um, um, you know, bury a couple of uh, food dispensing toys like, like a twist and treat, you know, I've shown these before, you put, um, you put canned food in these, you can put dry food in them too. Then there are lots of different kinds of food toys. But I like this one because you can put dry or canned in here and, and depending on how 
far you gap the halves apart, you can make it more or less challenging for the dog to get the food out. But while you're gone, in fact, if you never feed your dog from a bowl, and they always have to scrounge and scavenge and work like crazy and manipulate whatever kind of food toy you're using to scrape out the food, that is a very similar behavior to what they do in the wild when they're out there foraging and trying to get by. Yeah, they're predators and they eat what they kill, but they don't get that lucky every day. So this will simulate the natural foraging behavior of dogs. And if you drop a loaded food toy or a few of them on the floor as you leave in the morning and ignore and then pick them up when you return, the dog can learn from repetition that the only time I get to survive and scratch out my existence is when my people are gone. And they associate that. And so instead of watching you getting ready to leave and prepare to go, you know, put on your shoes and, you know, grab your jacket or whatever it is, and they, the dog goes, oh my goodness, she's leaving again. But then the dog learns that when I see her leaving, food appears or opportunities to survive appear. And they have to work like crazy. And this is actual physical exertion if these are challenging enough. And that makes them tired. And a tired dog is a happy dog. So food toys can be really helpful for this kind of stuff. But you know, with your dog, Dakota Christy, what I'm more suspicious of is that that dog has an itching problem, um, allergies, uh, mange it can be a smoldering problem that can be very difficult and in some cases close to impossible to demonstrate microscopically and we sometimes treat those pets for mange mites with treatments that are 100% safe and 100% effective. Some of them are oral, some are spot on treatments, but eliminate that but also very strongly consider allergies. And so a dog whose itching isn't overwhelming can actually feel pretty calm when its person is home because they're focused on us and earning interactions and watching us for behavioral cues, which a dog who's normally behaved does just as they would in the wild with a canine leader. But when you're gone, you, things aren't, aren't that interesting anymore, are they? And so you, uh, um, you don't want to... Uh, um, these cats just used a little bit of harsh language together. Um, so, but when you're gone, a Dakota doesn't have anything else to do, and that may be why the licking is occurring. So with a, any behavioral symptom, the first thing we do is look for the physical causes. Behavior is what we treat last. So deal with that before you go any further on that. Um, and your regular veterinarian should be able to help you with that. So, um, and uh, let's see, what else? Um, so here's what I wanted to do, was to share just a little bit of recent research. And this has to do with this business of ignoring as you leave and return. Um, and at first glance, this seems to shoot out of the water the advice that we've been giving pet parents of dogs with separation anxiety. Turns out it actually tells us something different. So here's part of the abstract. And the, the researchers always start with a hypothesis and then the research is about showing they were either correct or incorrect about it, okay? We hypothesized there would be an increase in activity, vocalizations, and time in proximity to the door for the dogs in the high arousal condition. They set up two groups, two conditions. One was a group of dogs where their people left with minimal communication with the dog or ignored them completely. And the other group are the people who kiss them and love them and say, oh, listen, please be good, and I'll be back, and don't worry, and don't lose your mind, and that kind of high arousal. So there were two conditions, high arousal and low arousal, okay? And they, they, they hypothesized the dogs in the high arousal condition compared with the low arousal group, when left alone, that these behaviors would increase. In other words, the dogs who had a lot of uh, excited communication with their people as the people left, those dogs' anxieties would get worse during their person's absence, okay? And our results did not show this, indicating that high arousal departures and arrivals may not play a role in the development of increased separation-related behavior. The operative word is the development. So let me read you a sentence from the conclusion at the very end of the research, and that is that 
Although low arousal arrivals and departures are still recommended in many behavior management plans for dogs with separation anxiety, um, the results from our experimental and survey data find no evidence to support the role of arrival and departure activity as a causal factor for the development of separation-related behavior problems. And this is from the Journal of Veterinary Behavior. And just this is kind of our specific uh, journal for our specialty. Uh, there's lots of other sources of, of research. Um, but anyway, um, so what's that all about? Well, the thing with um, separation anxiety is that there's a lot of concern people have sometimes that if you get a puppy and you make a big fuss throughout its life, or even if you get the dog as an adult, and you make a big fuss as you leave in return, that you are going to cause the dog to have separation anxiety. That's not so. We know that there are two primary factors that we have very robust research to support. One is the genetic hereditary predisposition for that problem. Um, and secondly, it is seen more often in dogs who had spent a significant amount of time in a shelter, um, which really brings uh, to mind the importance of these wonderful people who go to shelters and, ow! Foster. <laughs> he wanted that food too badly. Tony, he's an animal. Um, so if you, if you foster dogs from the shelter and they don't spend much time there and they come and spend time in your home until a good forever home can be found, those dogs have a lower risk of a variety of behavior problems in their long-term home and separation anxiety is top of the list, much less prone to have it. Now there are other factors as well, dogs with other anxiety-related behaviors like storm phobia, um, you know, aggression towards strangers. There's, those can be what we say comorbid, coexist in the same dog, but we don't cause separation anxiety by making a fuss with our dogs before leaving. But if your dog has separation anxiety, one of many changes that need to occur is that you need to give that dog the security of canine-specific leadership, which is when the leader leaves, it is a non-event. When we study dogs free living in groups, when they leave the territory, the leaders, and they all need to at least a couple times a day to get off territory, sniff and investigate, forage, look for dead stuff to eat, and encounter other dogs and do some rear end sniffing, you know, the whole thing. Um, they all have to do it. It's natural for dogs. That's why it's so important to get your dog off property. You have to take your dog for leash walks or go to the dog park or doggy daycare. Don't think just because you might have a big yard, your dog is fine. Sure, they can run around the yard, but they need to get off territory and sniff and investigate. It's essential to who they are. And when the leader leaves the territory to do that, there is no communication at all. What they don't do is what we do with our human families, where we you know, leave for work or the kids go to school and you know, a hug and a kiss, I love you, drive safely, uh, you know, right? We do that stuff. And then because we love our pets like little people in furry suits, we, we say, hey, look, I'm going to treat you just like a person. Uh, no, treat your dog like a dog and treat your cats like cats. Boys, here, have a piece of food. Here, Tony, little rascal. You guys are fussy little devils tonight. Um, that's the takeaway from that. Okay? So ignoring as you leave and return is a treatment for separation anxiety. And if you're pretty darn sure your dog doesn't have separation anxiety, knock yourself out and be as goofy as you want. And the dog won't get it, but they'll enjoy it. Okay? So, um, by the way, uh, each week you can get in your email box my weekly Facebook Live video and my weekly blog. And I'm doing something a little new with that. Thank you for those hearts. I'm putting some stories in my weekly blog in parts. So um, if you sign up or if you're already signed up in your Tuesday morning email, you'll get this video, but also you'll get my um, a story, the beginning of a story called Faith. And I have lots of them. I've been in practice a long time, and I've got so many great stories about pets that I have treated for all manner of ailments and, and injuries and behaviors that there's a, there's a, a kernel of of a lesson in helping pets bring out their best in every one of these things. So 
I'll, we'll have the first of those. And if you are not already a, a subscriber to my website, go to my website, Dr. Jeff Nickel, D R Jeff N I C H O L dot com. And at the bottom of the homepage, you can subscribe. Just put in your email address, and this will come every Tuesday morning. And when you do subscribe, you'll get at no charge, I'll send you my pet first aid and CPR guide for at home use, which can be a lifesaver. So, um, so has anybody uh, tried treating their dog like a dog? I hope so, at least some of the time, because <laughs> they really are not just like us. So what are the treatments that we have for separation anxiety? Let me show you a cool one. You may have seen me show you this one before. This is the Calmer Canine. Here, let me show you the box in reverse because you know most of our brains don't turn, turn around. Oops, mirror images. There we go. It's called the Calmer Canine. And you can go to their website, you can just Google Calmer Canine, or Calmer, and then the letter K and the number 9, uh, dot com. And that, you'll find um, this device. Well, this is a targeted pulse electromagnetic field device, and it looks like this. And there's a little uh, vest you can get with it. You know, it's a comfy fabric that goes around the neck with a little Velcro closure like a collar. And another strap that goes around the chest right behind the front legs with a little tab that connects the collar part with the chest part. And that positions it so that right behind the head there's a little Velcro patch. And you stick this little halo-shaped gizmo, okay? And you, and you push the button and it turns itself off after 15 minutes. And it, there's no sensation. The dog doesn't feel anything. But it actually targets the fear center of the brain, the amygdala, and adjust the chemistry within the microglia, the cells of the amygdala. And it promotes anti-inflammatory uh, neurotransmitters and inhibits pro-inflammatory ones. And it releases more serotonin and dopamine and endorphins. So these pets feel better and their anxiety is less. And so good research has shown and a lot of the research that was done on this and used for FDA approval um, was done on humans uh, because they're using this kind of treatment in people with severe anxiety disorders that haven't responded well to medication. This can take the place of medication, by the way, um, although, you know, these are pets whose lives really uh, need a lot of help. And it brings out the compassionate nature of those of us who love pets. You don't have to be a practicing veterinarian to really put your heart into this, do you? And I'm telling you that we took an oath when we graduated that we would reduce suffering in animals. And suffering isn't just pain elsewhere in the body. If you're just overwhelmed and freaked out, that's pain that needs to be addressed. So here's one of a couple of prescription medications and not the only one, but I'll just mention it. And it is actually a, a veterinary brand of fluoxetine. You love that uh, Madison Avenue name, Reconcile? It gives you that little clear sense that everything will be okay. Well, it's actually very, very effective for many of these. Very, very safe um, and it's chewable and it's approved for use in dogs and it's made in America, which means that uh, it's not cobbled together with components from, well, frankly, some of the generics from third world countries means that the consistency isn't the same every time and the human generics are not always well absorbed in a canine intestinal tract. So, you know, a veterinary approved chewable medication when we need it, and boy, I'll tell you, we don't shy away from medications if that's what it takes to improve life. Um, we do, you know, it's, it's all research supported. People are concerned about safety. We have that figured out. So we do what it takes. Um, so what else? Uh, food Toys talked about that, crating. Many people feel like, look, I cannot have my house destroyed by this dog anymore, so I'm going to keep the dog in a crate. Oh, my goodness. When they're crate, crated, many of them, if not most, freak out, and they will do whatever it takes to break loose, including cutting their lips, breaking their nails, and fracturing their teeth. You can go on the Internet, and you can order crates, dog crates, that are guaranteed to be escape-proof. My goodness, they look like a vault. And these dogs are absolutely panicked and can't do anything about it. What we really need to do is avoid that problem. And so until our 
medications, our calmer canine, our behavior modifications, management changes. There's a whole bunch of stuff we do with these dogs. And until those have started making a significant difference, we do video monitoring to know, we don't let them stay home alone. We take them to doggy daycare or play dates with other dogs. But confining them, they get much worse and it is cruel and unusual. And you know, people say, but I, I can't have them doing this kind of damage. No, you can't. But the real damage that bothers me, of course, it isn't my house, but the damage that bothers me is what's going on in the brain. And these pets just get much worse. So please don't crate a dog who's been destructive when home alone. Outdoor access matters. The, uh, the idea of a, um, Tony, here, baby. Um, Tony, look, baby. Um, of, a, uh, of a dog door and a digging box, that can really, that can really help. So let's see, all right, we have a couple more questions. Um, let's see here, uh, somebody had a question. Um, Eli the Poodle, George and the Cat. Uh, John, uh, um, you're welcome, Christy. I hope that was helpful. Um, Donna, wonderful. Alisa, yes, we ignore them when leaving and arriving, and wow, it works wonders. Uh, you know, and, and it's really, sometimes there are pets. Um, could you write in comments this device names? Yes, I will, Kareen. I'll make it a point to do that. Um, and I always leave without making a big fuss, and I come home without a fuss, too. I don't pay attention at all to the dogs for a minute or so. Yeah, and you know what you can do on that, OJ, is as you come home, you know, you're ignoring. You're not ignoring your dog or dogs. You're acting as though you don't have pets. You just walk in and go about your business. And then if you steal a quick glance and you notice that somebody is calming down, reinforce improvement. Don't wait until they're completely zen before you say, oh, you're a good dog, because you just don't have enough opportunities to reward the behaviors you want. Yeah, we want to reward calm, no question, but we also want to reward calming, improving, if they are calmer. So you can say very quietly, if you steal a quick glance after you've arrived home and your dog is a little calmer, then you can say, good dog, like that. Because your dog will follow your emotional lead, especially if she's already agitated. And then you can ignore again. And then a minute or so later, steal another quick glance like that. Did you catch that? Like that. And if the dog's just a little calmer, you can say, good dog. And the dog earns those interactions from you. Here's another important difference, and I'll quit for the night. Another important difference between dogs and humans is that the people in our families, especially our children, but also our friends, uh, the hierarchy in the workplace, in our human culture, when somebody, regardless of whether they're higher or lower ranking, has a question, it's pretty much an understood obligation that you're going to give them a response, right? Not with dogs. They regard an interaction or a response from a leader as a privilege, not an entitlement. They don't believe they have any right to get a response. So when they do, they are sure that they just earned it. And what earned it was their behavior and their emotional state of that moment. So if your dog is agitated and you're responding in any way at all, uh, cuddling, oh, you're all right, uh, I'm going to kill you, I mean, <laughs> whatever your response, your dog comes away believing that the behavior and the emotional state was just reinforced. So if you don't like that high agitation and you don't, it's not healthy, then you can extinguish it by ignoring it. And that's exactly the right thing to do. But Look for every opportunity to acknowledge improved behavior. Catch them doing something right, including calming themselves just a little bit. Look for every opportunity to say, that was the right thing. But remember, don't get enthusiastic if you want your dog to remain calm. Enthusiasm is great when you teach your dog to come when called and you get enthusiastic as she runs in because you want your dog to come enthusiastically every time you call him. But with this wild behavior that's associated with being left or the return of the great leader, we don't want to associate any kind of enthusiasm with that because just like, just as it would be if your dog were free living in a feral group of dogs and they had a territory and the leader, like everybody, 
took a break and went and sniffed and explored outside the territory, that leader leaving and returning is a non-event. So your leaving and returning should have no meaning either. So thank you. Any other questions? Let me see. And we'll sign off here. Swipe to reveal. Thank you, swiping. Okay. And uh, uh, let's see. I think that's it. And yes, Corinne, I will write that, that device, the comma canine. Um, and by the way, that's one of the few things that uh, I've ever known. Well, the only thing I know in the medical field is that if it doesn't work for your dog, you can return it and they will refund your money. Okay? It's a little over $200. And uh, that is certainly worth everything, knowing that it's a zero risk. So I would suggest you do that. There's a coupon code box uh, when you order it. And for uh, veterinary behaviorists, for specialists in behavior medicine um, who recommend it, um, if you put my first name in there, Jeff, uh, you'll get an extra 15% off. So do that. Um, so take the time to build a foundation of trust and choice and freedom for your pets. Because just like us, dogs and cats will get obstinate if their leader only wants their needs met. But I'll tell you one other thing about pets that's actually a little different than we are, is that any time during a relationship, they're ready to learn that they can trust us not to intimidate them. So if you've made mistakes and scared your pet, it's really okay. They always give a second chance, and they always, they always forgive. So they're, they're a pretty good example, don't they? So thank you for tuning in. Uh, Tony says good night. Uh, Gaston is just luxuriating and acting like he's camera shy, which he doesn't even care that the camera's on because he's a cat. So thank you again, and everybody have a great week, and please be safe out there. And Tony T, maybe I could give you a little hug. Come here, you little rascal. That's a good